Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome in, everyone. I'm going to wait a few minutes before we get started to let a couple more people join. Welcome. morning, everyone. We're just waiting on a few more people to join before we get started. How is everyone doing today? Feel free to share in the chat where you are joining us from. I'm in Sacramento, California, and it's bright and sunny here. Welcome in, everyone. We have a few people joining from San Diego. Welcome. A couple from San Francisco, San Jose, a few from Sacramento. Welcome, you guys. Palm Springs, welcome in. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. My name is Victor Mendoza. I am a program coordinator, too, at CFILC, and I will be moderating today's webinar. For audio description purposes, I am a Latino man in my 20s with brown skin and black hair, and I am wearing a great button-up shirt with red and blue stripes. First off, if you would like to access captions, go to the meeting controls on the bottom of your screen and select the CC icon titled Live Transcript, and you can click the option Show Subtitle to gain access to captioning. You can also use the stream text link that I will drop in the chat shortly. This is a great option because you can change the font size, font color, or make the captioning full screen. Please note all questions should be entered in the Q&A located in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen or signaled with a raised hand, a function which is also located in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. We are reserving the last 10 minutes of our webinar for Q&A and we will try our best to address everyone's questions. Thank you guys for sitting through a bit of my housekeeping and I will now hand it over to Catherine. Hello, my name is Katherine Crowley. I am a Chicanx woman in her 30s with sunset colored hair and glasses. Um, thank you for joining us today. Ability Tools is very excited to kick off our partnership with Able Gamers. Um, Able Gamers has been supporting people with disabilities game for almost 20 years now. And this webinar is the sort of kickoff to Ability Tools working with Able Gamers to be able to bring that kind of support to the state of California. Um, we'll add a broad, in a broader way. Um, they, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to our first presenter from Able Gamers, um, Andy Wu. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm joined by two of my colleagues. I'll introduce them just a little bit, um, but I'll do be presenting primarily uh, the, the bulk of this presentation. Um, so I joined Naval Gamers in 20, September 2021. I have the very fortunate privilege of representing the organization in this capacity um, and partnering with Ability Tools and getting some of this much needed service out to the state of California. So the, the presentation agenda today will consist of mainly four parts, a little chat about who we are as an organization, our history, key personnel, specifically on my team, um, executing this part of our mission. We'll talk briefly about player experiences. So mainly the reason why we do what we do here at Able Gamers. Um, the actual what we do. Uh, so what does uh, peer counseling look like? How we do this adaptive gaming? And as Victor uh, responded, I will try to save the last uh, 10 minutes or so. I don't know about the timing specifically, but uh, for a question and answer. 
So our organization um, has its, its mission, um, which essentially boiled down, we're using the power of video games to help people with disabilities. Um, this organization was founded in 2004 with our executive director and founder, Mark Marley, driven this uh, mission forward and really advocating for deaf gaming. Um, now we're actually doing a lot of the work. Uh, we're still advocating, bringing awareness that this service, this ability to get into gaming um, should be for everybody. Um, and largely we're on our end, um, we have a very small team, um, but very dedicated and very passionate team. Uh, we're slowly adding to this capacity um, in different ways. Our team as a total at A1 Gamers is around 14 or 15, I believe, uh, a mix of primarily full-time and some part-time. Um, but my overall, my responsibility as uh, Senior Director of Peer Counseling uh, is to oversee Jesse and Aaron in doing the day-to-day -day work, um, but also largely to drive this uh, ability of able gamers to genuinely partner with organizations uh, to get some of this work done. Um, so my background is in occupational therapy um, and in program development. Uh, I've started a few programs, OT programs. I'm an, oh, sorry, I'm an occupational therapist by trade. I started in, um, an occupational therapy assistant program, an occupational therapy doctorate program. I taught in a master's of occupational therapy program. I'm based out in Kansas City. Uh, Jesse Hall, who's also on this call. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself real quick, Jesse? That's okay. Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Jesse Hall. Um, I'm a senior peer counselor with, with the peer counseling team. Um, I've been with Able Gamers now since about 2015-16 and started off as a volunteer and now I work um, full-time on and part-time currently because I have a little one at home. Um, and previously I was more with the engineering lining side of Able Gamers, but now I'm full-fledged over in peer counseling and has been the happiest time hanging out with these two on our team. Um, and then for, um, I'm a, a early 30s uh, white woman with uh, brunette hair and a silver and some kind of a sir, yeah, silver and pink polka dot um, uh, top on with white glasses and my head, my big headphones that go around my ears. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, and we do have one more as well, Aaron Price. I believe he is still making his way to the call with us here, uh, but he's another one of our stellar peer counselors um, and is also a, a full-time quad stick user and he's a very um, advanced level quad stick user. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it back to Andy. Thanks, Jesse, appreciate it. Sorry, I forgot to introduce my little and spiel. I'm a nearly middle-aged male uh, with glasses, Asian pepper, salt and peppered hair, black and white hair, uh, wearing a black t-shirt today. Um, Aaron Price, who, um, Aaron Price and I are both in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Aaron, are you here? Do you wanna say a little bit about yourself real quick? Um, sure. Um, my name is Aaron Price, and uh, I'm a peer counselor um, here at Able Gamers. Um, I am a quadriplegic, so uh, I uh, suffered a spinal cord injury in 2014. Um, uh, I guess lucky for me, in in a in a sense, uh, it gives me a, a unique uh, perspective or insight into. Uh, what kind of uh, adaptive controls are uh, out there for people uh, with uh, similar disabilities uh, to my to myself? Uh, anyways, uh, that that is all uh -huh. for me from me for now. Yeah, we'll hear from Aaron just a little bit. Uh, so I'll jump right into it. Um, the next part of our presentation really focuses on these player experiences. Um, uh, this research is grounded in our work on one side of our organization um, that interfaces largely with game developers and game studios. The, the work of uh, Dr. Chris Power, who's our senior director of user research, um, has studied, you know, he's, he, he on that end of our organization helps game developers and game studios develop games for as many people as possible and with that in mind, right? Um, and I'll share exactly what I mean by that. So with, with a lot of the research he's done on his side, 
we come down to this, uh, this very large study uh, done a few years ago that polled people with disabilities and people without disabilities and really got down to the bottom of the idea of experiences and what we have uh, come to find out with this is why people play video games, right? What experiences are people looking for? Um, so through this research, we identified five key experiences that people want to have. The first and most powerful one uh, is connection. I think most of the people on, our, on this call, especially with my team, for sure, I would say, uh, we're looking to connect with other people. Largely, this is done either by two different types of video games, essentially. You have single player games and you have multiplayer games. Multiplayer games is uh, pretty self-explanatory. You play with other people, right? You sit, you sit down on the couch, you see behind me, I have a Nintendo, Nintendo old Nintendo gaming system. Uh, I used to spend literally um, hours and hours in a day playing with my brother and cousin on that one, on that device. Um, and, and so largely, a lot of the people that come to us as a charity asking for help, they want to play with their family, their friends, their schoolmates, their peers. Uh, they want to connect with other people through video games, right? Um, so that's multiplayer. You play with other people. You also play single player games. Right, you explore different worlds, you do these quests. Not that those aren't in multiplayer games, but single player games like Tears of the Kingdom just came out, the Zelda game. Uh, Breath of the Wild was the one right before that. Those are single player games. And those single player games, you beat bosses, you complete quests, you explore this, you, you do that. Those, I would venture to guess that you probably want to share that with somebody. You want to connect with another person and say, you know how difficult that level was or how much time that took me to do that or this was so cool about this game right those are those shared connection experiences that people are seeking so then we get to diversion um diversion really is about um diverting our attention away from something that consumes the majority of time right um so like for example, in therapy world, in my background, diverting um, someone's attention from pain to something enjoyable, right? Which is a little bit different from escapism, right? Um, that's just experiencing something that you don't have in your day-to-day, -day, your escape being. Um, benefit is the fourth experience right, um, that people can benefit from online games or multiplayer games. So for example, some games, uh, we've had people report that some games um, benefit their day-to-day -day lives because they're now wanting to learn Japanese because that was a big part of the game they played. Artistic experiences. Um, this comes in, in many forms where people just really want to experience the story. They want to get enveloped into the, the characters and the character's relationship with another person in the game to really have that experience that the game developers and game studios designed as part of the game, right? So not really just about only completing the quest, but how does the quest um tie into the overall story arc of this in, entire game so it's like watching a movie but a little more a lot more active of course right um so as a quick review these are the, sh the shared experiences from everyone people with disabilities people without disabilities right the one unique one experience that dr chris power and his research found was the sense of enablement it's such a powerful thing when we think about video games as the median medium that uh, people can use to engage with other people, right? Um, this last part, the quote from Stephen Spawn, our senior director of development, Able Gamers, um, it is an art form that allows us to run, jump, and be whatever we want to be. Right? I think that's so powerful. It's our driving force. It's a driving force for the work that we do here in peer counseling is that we're helping people be enabled, people with disabilities, right? So peer counseling, this is the pillar I oversee at Able Gamers. Um, and the, a side pillar of this one um, is engineering research, we'll kind of talk about in just a second. But 
Um, peer counseling is really just um, a, a term that we use here. It's one of our pillars. It's a foundational activity of the organization. It's really just as providing this one-on-one -on -one guidance to individual players. So you have, you see this virtual um, Google Meet screenshot. You have Aaron Price in the top left. You have Mina G, who's our partner at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. You have Charles Johnson in the bottom left photo, who is an engineer, a maker, a tinkerer. And you have me down on the bottom right. In the top middle picture, you have Wayne McGrath. He is a player that we supported in the UK, United Kingdom. Um, he wanted to play Rocket League. We hopped on a virtual call. All of us on the call are centered around helping this individual through a combination of understanding what game he wants to play, how he wants to play it, what barriers he has to get playing it better, what are the commercial solutions that are available, what are the 3D printed and or maker type solutions that can be mixed into this solution overall for his gaming improvement, and then how we can support him in a general, genuine way um, as best we can. So eventually, I like to kind of show this one. This is essentially what we're trying to get at. Pictures of people happily playing their games or connecting with other people or just, in, 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 right, just enjoying video games, right? Through different setups uh, and different solutions that we have and we can get. But how do we go about this work, right? Not to get too much into the weeds, but we kind of talk about this feedback loop a lot. It comes from our other side of our organization on the user research professional development side where we're training game developers, but it's definitely applicable here in this world of peer counseling. It's this, it's this feedback loop. So you see this kid on the left, he has this controller in his hand and the blue top ones are represented in the, in the input device and the control. So essentially this, this kid is going to push some buttons and or move the joystick and provide some input into the game world. The game world then has a way of presenting some sort of information and spitting it out through an output device. That output device is largely a screen. Uh, can be also um, audio. It can be haptic feedback in the, in the way of holding the controller provides some vibration. And then the player then, the, why, why is it a loop? The player then has to interpret that input, right? Or that, uh, I'm sorry, that output from the game world, from the screen, from the audio. And they have to do something with it by a series of quick processing that happens cognitively, which results in more button pushes and more joystick movements. And then we have that loop, right? Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? So why is this a problem really? And we're talking about people with disabilities. Why, why do we encounter uh, the large majority and representation of our work happens because you see these standard controllers. These aren't all of them. There are a lot of standard controllers. There are a lot of aftermarket controllers. Um, they largely conform to your hand. They have physical attributes and, or affordances that necessitate that you hold the controller a certain way in a typical fashion, right? You can literally hold them however you want but will you be able to push all the buttons or move the joysticks appropriately as the game wants you to and as you need to? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, so you see each of these joysticks, they look very, very similar. They have two analog sticks, thumbsticks, or, or joysticks, basically. They have a series of buttons. And they have a series of triggers up on top, largely. So a lot of the people with disabilities that we encounter that ask us for help, um, they have some issues with this input device for peer counseling anyway. We're very fortunate to be part of this project. We have the grandfather version of this, Able Gamers does before I joined actually, and Jesse, Jesse knows about the history and all that, but 
We have the fortunate uh, pleasure to work with Xbox and other charities and other nonprofit organizations to develop out this, this, this native Xbox controller, the Xbox Adaptive Controller. So you've probably seen it as this white big controller up on the top left of this image that looks like the Nintendo controller. It has a little directional pad in the bottom left corner and has two gigantic black buttons, right? Um, the face of this is not its most powerful feature. The most powerful feature of this controller is that it has a series of ports all along the back. Of it. I'll kind of hold one up for reference. So in my video, you see all these little ports, these little holes, basically, that you can plug in a series of switches or, or USB devices. So essentially, our approach here with adaptive gaming is because individuals that we encounter, at least, have difficulty operating, holding, manipulating the buttons and joysticks in the current way that the controllers from these manufacturers produce, we're looking to build a setup around the user, right? You put the switches where the person can access. Um, so for joysticks, for example, where are the most reliable places, perhaps a thumb, a chin that has a um, multi-directional um, uh, joint here at the, at the neck. Um, where can buttons be put? Anywhere. Uh, by a toe, a knee could activate it, the head could activate it, depending on what the game needs and where the user um, has the best access, right? And so you get these beautiful setups that are being created, right? Um, this top one was of a guy, I believe, in the northern part of the United States. I can't remember exactly. He built his little setup uh, based on our recommendations and some of the equipment that we sent him. The bottom middle picture is actually one I don't recognize. It's from online, I believe. Um, but you see, I, I like to show that bottom middle one because it's essentially um, a variant of the of the one right above it, but it's very, very clean. So I use it as an example to say that people are taking pride in their setups. They want to hide all the wires. They want to make it nice and neat and, and so on and so forth, right? The two pictures flanking each of the bottom, the two pictures flanking the middle picture on the bottom are examples of work from Craig Hospital. There's a very passionate recreational therapist out there. She might be on the call maybe, but uh, Daniel Scroggs, I have to credit her work. She's building, she's building these very bespoke, customized controllers for individuals based on what type of games they want to play and what type of movement and their body position, right? So you see largely that each of the joysticks that they produce often has a joystick or two joysticks in a series of buttons. Essentially, we're trying to recreate these standard controllers and all the functions of these standard controllers into a setup that works for the individual, right? Um, and I really love the work that she does because you can tell that these controllers then are for this specific person, right? And, and they could just be lifted and put onto a tabletop surface or mounted to a wheelchair to where that person can just play instead of spending tremendous amounts of time with the setup part, which often is a very big barrier to caregivers or, or people willing to support the, the end user. Um, because when you wanna play the game, you wanna play. You don't necessarily wanna wait a whole half hour for all these things to be plugged in and all the wires to be managed and to connect this and that. It's very cumbersome. Okay. The other part that I referenced um, with, uh, this is the actual controller. So we, haven't, we have a pillar engineering research that we're still kind of developing out. This is when simply commercial products really just don't exist or are really, really expensive for us as a charity to purchase. Um, this we collaborated with um, the maker uh, in Rhode Island who helped us to design the controller that added extra joysticks. Here you see represented in the top left picture on number 12 and 11. Those two are extra joysticks to a standard joystick already on the market. But we had to get the board, uh, the PCB board, um, the electronics board that runs this controller. We had to source all these little buttons. 
We had to 3D print the joysticks. We had to assemble and wire all this and clean it up. That's what our engineering person, maker person did for us and in collaboration with us. These joysticks are really important from an OT perspective, from a gaming perspective. Wayne McGrath played Rocket League. Rocket League, you can play with one joystick and two buttons. If you do want the additional joystick, which you can integrate into your gameplay, it's simply a matter of flicking that additional joystick so that you can not, so one joystick operates driving the vehicle around. So Rocket League is a game where you have a field, essentially on the screen, you just simplify it. You have two cars basically ramming a gigantic ball and playing soccer. So you're playing soccer with cars. You're trying to get that huge ball into a soccer goal, basically, right? A, a net. Um, so you're driving and the, the car is focusing on where you're driving, not necessarily where the ball is, which could be behind you, it could be to the left of you, uh, it could be out of your sight. That additional joystick, uh, Aaron, if, if you're on, if so to my knowledge, if you flick that, you're able to focus right on the ball. That's what that additional joystick allows. But the joystick, the controller that Wayne McGrath in this situation was, was utilizing had put in a lot of time into and practiced with did not have that additional joystick. And so to improve his gameplay because he was interested in competing uh, in a tournament of some sorts, I can't remember exactly which one, he needed that extra joystick function. So with that joystick function, we sought to build his controller and simply add that joystick as part of the solution because we did not want to completely alter how he played the game currently, how much time that he invested and spent already in the current controls that he had, right? Well, this is just an example. Um, took a tremendous amount of time, a lot of back and forth, several, several months to kind of develop this and, and get this deployed out to him. Um, we have other solutions that we're working on here at Able Gamers. Um, largely, you've seen these, uh, this is my daughter's little hand in this picture, but anyway, this is a mounting board of sorts, right? Um, we have a lot of these switches. You're probably familiar with these spec switches, the blue, the yellow, the red, this micro light switch that her finger is on right now. We can't just throw these onto a table. Uh, again, back to the point that the person who wants to play video games wants kind of a setup or a controller to access when they want to play, right? So we're developing mounting solutions. These don't really exist in a, in a nice way, in my opinion, anyway. Um, some boards can be had, you can put Velcro on, there's different solutions that have that. Um, this is just a different solution, essentially, to mount things and to manage some of the wires. That's a huge kind of, a, a huge component to adaptive gaming is, is managing all the wires that come from these switches and joysticks. Um, the last image here is of a electronics board of sorts. We're developing things like this. I have one behind me, the first iteration of it. This is called the Freedom Wing Adapter. But nothing like this exists on the market to my knowledge. And I am a huge nerd and I thought this was really cool right when I first started was that this device when plugged into um, uh, our colleague's wheelchair, Stephen Spahn, um, enables the joystick of his power wheelchair to serve as the joystick in the game, right? You think about the approach where yeah, as a as therapist, um, seating mobility for power wheelchairs or whatnot, we, we often place the joystick where, where the person has the most reliable access. We ask them to practice using that joystick to, to, um, to be mobile in their environment, on different terrains and or whatnot. So they're already used to that joystick, be it a micro light or a standard joystick or a, or a goalpost T-topper type joystick like this. They're at places where people can access them. And so why introduce another piece of technology or a different joystick and have them practice that, which might not be um, best practice. So a lot of the effort that's already spent, uh, particularly on the user end, just to the same point where um, in this example, it's very, very similar, just not with power wheelchairs. 
And then we also had the fortunate opportunity as an organization to contribute to future development and feedback and thoughts on commercial products. So just like with the Xbox adaptive controller, this is a completely different approach to adaptive gaming, um, accessible gaming, whatever have you from PlayStation, PlayStation 5 particularly. Um, it was the project's name is Project Leonardo. It has now since been named the Access Controller. Access. So this one, if uh, so, this is a, we have a standard PlayStation 5 controller up on top. We have two of the Access controllers on the bottom that have a series of switches on a circular pattern uh, with joysticks attached and two different types of toppers of joysticks. And these joysticks can, uh, as we see in the blog post, and I can reference you that if you want later on, but these joysticks can adjust out from the center of the device. Um, so it can be customized. These are mountable as well, which is really cool. But you know, this is a very different approach from PlayStation um, than, than what we see in Xbox which is the other manufacturer or console that, that supports um, a native adaptive controller, so to speak. All the buttons and joysticks are included versus where you saw with the Xbox adaptive controller, all these little buttons and joysticks are outsourced, right? This is a different approach and all these buttons are attached or available when you purchase the device, right? We don't know how much it costs yet. So um, that's to be determined in the future. But anyway, the other side, um, largely I kind of referenced it a little bit, engineering research, but not exactly. Um, we have 3D printed solutions. So this offers us the ability when commercial products may be just really, really expensive, or we just need a minor tweak or a modification to something. So you see in this controller here, these bottom controls, I'll start with those. These controllers simply are attachments. They have attachments to standard controllers. Uh, I, I do still consider Xbox adaptive controller a standard controller because it's within the family of Xbox controllers, but they've gone the extra step of modifying it so that someone with um, lacking hand dexterity can use it in a more gross pattern to activate the directional pad. So this blue uh, T-bar, um, attachment, 3D printed, simply just attaches right onto it. The other approach that we've seen a large movement towards is this one-handed gaming. So you have a lot of people like amputees on one side, or you have people after stroke or brain injury that typically have the, the plesia or paralysis on one side of their body. It's a completely different style of gameplay though, right? Where you see the top left controller, it's a, um, a person playing with the PlayStation 4 controller, I believe. There's a 3D printed solution that latches directly onto the controller. The bottom has a shoe um, of sorts. It's a saddle type joint, um, but it is attached to the right thumbstick. So this user is a left-handed user that is using the thumb to operate the left thumbstick but moving the controller around in space while it rests on the thigh to operate the right thumbstick. And then the thumb has access to all the buttons that are traditionally on the right side of the, the controller, right? Um, this is a similar one, the blue one up in top. It's the, it's the Xbox one. And then you have some one-handed adaptations for the Nintendo Switch controllers to pair them up. So as you know, with Nintendo Switch, the controllers are on the side of the console that are dockable and detachable. Once they're detached, there's no way to really bring them together besides typically through what looks like a, a standard controller. So kind of like this, where you have one side of the Joy-Con here, on the other side, you have another Joy-Con. Um, this one brings it a little bit closer so that the person has access and can reach all the buttons with one hand. Um, the red picture, the, the picture with the red Joy-Cons on the very right side under the 3D printed solution um, heading uh, is of a larger style uh, Joy-Con. Those Joy-Cons uh, are not pleasant for me to hold. And I 
I don't have any disabilities in my hand, um, but I, I don't prefer holding them for long periods of time because they're just not comfortable. This is the larger formats where you can still access the, 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 the joystick and all the buttons. Uh, so where does that leave with uh, and what, what we're doing here today? Um, ability tools uh, through a series of trainings uh, and, and different, um, uh, Catherine Crowley and I have been working on this uh, play and to hatch, a, a, hatch up a, a, a good way to bring adaptive gaming to the state of California uh, for about a year now or a little more so. Um, as part of the Powered by Able Gamers program, uh, this is where I kind of reference you know, our ability, my ability based on Kansas City to travel all through the United States when whatever we have somebody is not realistic. We have a small team as well. That's not realistic unless we want to serve maybe just a handful of people per month at most, right? Um, this, so this is just our ability then to partner with other programs and different facilities and organizations across the United States uh, to figure out what resources you all have uh, combined with the resources that what we have, not to overlap the resources, um, but then also just to figure out what the person needs and, and how we connect them in the community with the other resources that are available in California, for example, in this case, um, I don't know all the different organizations in California, right, for funding and support and for this condition or whatnot. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot, and you all know that best. Uh, what we know best, we have the ability to source equipment. We can outright grant equipment because we're a charity. We don't often have that restriction, much like a lot of the AT programs in the United States. They often uh, can demo, they can train, they can loan the equipment for periods of time. They, some have financing options that I've, I've been told about, um, but we don't often have that restriction. Our restriction comes from the geographic nature of our work um, and that we have inquiries from all over the United States and, and worldwide, honestly, not that it's a heavy amount of representation of our work, but um, our Power by Able Gamers program really is this uh, our ability to um, power up different programs, so support the programs and the partners. So this is a uh, rehab engineer out in uh, Pittsburgh, Stephanie, uh, where we're providing synchronous support to our partner. We have a client here um, who is integrating a sip and puff device into his gaming setup. Stephanie was unsure of the game that the person wanted to play and how and what button this sip and puff switch would represent. So we hopped on a call. I believe Aaron and I were both on a call for an hour, an hour and a half, something, trying to troubleshoot this sip and puff device and integrate to a system, right? This is kind of like what we're doing today, um, although this will be um, step two, phase two, what have you, the next one we do, uh, a much more directed um, training program compilation of best practices, so to speak, that Jesse Hall will primarily be in charge of uh, and lead. Uh, you actually see her kind of in the screen right here in the center. Um, she's interacting with several therapists here to train them in Rocket League. So the Rocket League is the game that you see on the screen. They're playing with adaptive controls, right? So next picture is another Google Meet picture of us supporting some folks in Texas who may be on the call or not. They are the Texas Technology Access Program, the, the TAP program in Texas. Angela Stanridge and her, um, her colleague Shannon Page are both on the call. They were hosting a exhibit booth of some sort at an event. Uh, they wanted some information on joysticks and some switches and what might be best to present for that population. The last picture I'll show here, and before we get on to process, um, is of a site that we have in Kansas City uh, called Ability KC. It's an outpatient neuro, maybe a little ortho, um, rehab day program type of facility. Um, Aaron Price is in the right picture. Um, he's kind of in blue, all blue with black shoes on. Um, so this is where we support people with disabilities in, in, in the Kansas City area. So where we have the therapists that you see in both pictures um, serving as a point of contact for the setups, right? Facilitating also the referrals, right? Because um, we don't have a physical location other than outside of Washington, D.C., which 
is cumbersome and not feasible for people to travel to as well. And that's why this approach of partnering is happening. So getting right to it then, um, how do we do this, right? The process of partnering. Um, we first want to identify then the end user. We want to identify somebody who wants to either play video games or get back into playing video games. Kind of speaks to like the congenital type of um, and or just the interest never was there. They do not have a lot of experience or someone who has a lot of experience and, and some disability or injury or condition is really taking that away from them. We want to identify who that person is and get them in the Able Gamers ticketing system. So essentially, it's, it represents like a medical chart, if you will, um, although nothing really like medical about it. So a lot of personal information, a lot of information about their story, about the games they like. It grants us the ability to facilitate some of the liability and media release forms that we need on our end to do our work. Wow. So through the point of contact um, at Ability Tools at the different locations that we're establishing, uh, we're able to get this person and the person has a physical person to help. And like a way to put it, like a virtual person enable gamers, right? Um, and again, both organizations have different roles and responsibilities and also like different resources to contribute to the whole process of helping someone get, get back into gaming. Um, we go about the work of developing what that looks like. Uh, so either co-treating, we, we just provide support as needed, and then we go back and forth in creating this controller setup. So eventually, I think in time for the next training, um, which I don't know the data for right now, but we'll be sending out kits, so to speak, to those two locations in California. Uh, what's included in the kits are a sampling of, of adaptive things, right? Joysticks and buttons and different solutions. There's a lot. And I think um, being part of uh, the AT world, I guess, um, what we often trial for people is what they may adopt, but it has to fit for the person. So it's this back and forth of saying, uh, does this joystick work for this game in the way that you want it to? And is it responsive enough that you can get done what you want done in this game? and not get frustrated. So there's this level of challenge that games present, but we don't necessarily want the tools we use to be the challenge in the game, if that makes sense, right? You don't want, you don't want a button that you push, be so cumbersome to push, from our perspective at least, the rehab perspective might be a little different. I don't ever want someone to sweat over, you know, like two button pushes to play a game, Maybe the game becomes frustrating and unengaging. You don't feel like playing the game. You're struggling with the actual tools to play the game, right? So this con creating a controller setup is this basically this back and forth trial of, hey, let's try this setup. Let's try these switches. Let's try this mounting solution, what have you, and, and see how this works. Um, on the tail end then, this um, deliver, um, it is our intent then that through these partnerships and I kind of want to slow roll it because we're not a huge charity. We have three, two and a half people literally working with career counseling and working with all these partner sites um, to figure out there might be just one to two people per month that we can help at each of these partner sites because these take time. It's not a simple order. Let me order this and this and I'm on my way. Now it could be, oftentimes it's not though as what we have um, encountered. Um, but it's our ability then to deliver the actual equipment to the user. Uh, so we'll send it right to their house. We'll package it all up at headquarters and get it all out to them. Then we rely on our partners to kind of do the physical setup. We also have a link that we'd like to direct people to that you see here, the SurveyMonkey. Um, and we, we kind of need your help with this as well. To collect, or collect testimonials, photos would be great. Um, it's our ability to really... Um, tell people what we do very succinctly, very quickly. Um, Cause it, you know, I don't know if people really want to hear the, the back and forth and all the, the nerdiness that comes with solving, you know, accessibility and adaptive gaming. Um, with that, I think we have about five minutes if we reserve the Q and A, uh, I'll hand it off to Aaron. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit about this journey. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Aaron, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, I'm a peer counselor, and uh, I'm going to tell you kind of a little bit uh, about my experience with uh, adaptive gaming and kind of like uh, the evolution I experienced uh, in getting to uh, where I am at uh, with my gaming today. Um, I'm a, I'll start out with saying that I'm a, a lifelong gamer, um, and uh, I started out um, without uh, a disability. So I started playing games, uh, what uh, most people would call normally, um, with a, a regular controller, with a regular Super Nintendo controller. And uh, in 2014, uh, I experienced uh, a, a car accident that caused a spinal cord injury. And uh, that spinal cord injury left me paralyzed from the chest down. And uh, I have some movement in my arms, some gross movement, but uh, no movement in my fingers. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I figured I would never be able to play video games again. Um, can you go uh, to the next slide for me, Andy? Uh, actually, go to the next slide after that one. Um, after my injury, uh, I ended up in a rehabilitation hospital. Um, it, in this, uh, at this time, kind of like uh, my, my psyche or my thoughts, I was, I was pretty depressed at the time. Um, I didn't think, uh, again, I didn't really think that I'd be able to play video games again. Uh, I didn't think there was a, a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to do again. Um, can you go to the next slide for me? A rec uh, recreational uh, therapist at the rehabilitation hospital um, I was at uh, knew that I had an interest in playing video games at the time. So what they did was they did, I guess, a little bit of research into what adaptive gaming was available to them at the time and grabbed a, an adaptive controller um, and put me in a room with said adaptive controller. And when I saw the adaptive controller, I gotta tell you, uh, my hopes kind of were dashed um, because essentially in 2014, the adaptive equipment that was available for video gaming was an oversized version of an Xbox controller. Um, since uh, I figured that was all that was available uh, for adaptive gaming, I just kind of um, ignored gaming for a little while. Um, and can you go to the next slide for me? And uh, that kind of resulted in me being pretty bored. I got home uh, from the rehabilitation hospital. And uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, bad side effects of uh, having a severe disability is the isolation that you experience as a result of it. It's really difficult to travel. Um, so you don't get to see people a whole lot. Uh, you're kind of stuck in your own home. And uh, as a result of said boredom, uh, a, uh, a friend of mine approached me with an idea. <laughs> uh, he's just like, hey, have you heard of this game called Clash of Clans? You can play it on your iPhone. I was just like, uh, no, I haven't heard of it. Um, sure, I'll download it and I'll give it a go. Uh, I downloaded it, started playing it, and loved it. It was a game that I could actually manipulate with just a simple stylus lashed to my hand. And I poked at it with my phone. And uh, I was really surprised I could play video games again. Not only play video games again, but I had contact, uh, if you would, uh, with the outside world, with the friends again. I was playing video games with friends again. And that was hugely exciting and a great uh, like boon to my mental health 
I would say. Um, can you go to the next slide for me? Well, since uh, I was able to successfully play a video game on my phone, uh, the next natural progression for me was to start trying to play on my computer. Um, so then I started playing uh, simple point and click games um, with a trackball mouse. And uh, they were turn-based games, games that didn't require um, immediate reaction time. And they were card games, simple card games like Hearthstone, uh, another game called Slay the Spire. Um, and then I found another game. It wasn't a card game, but it was a turn-based game called Darkest Dungeon. Um, and that one was a really, really fun game. And every single one of these games allowed me to uh, connect with my friends um, and uh, play games that they were also playing and get to talk about those games whenever we met up, whenever they came over to my house or whenever I called them on the phone. Can you go to the next slide for me? Well, then in 2016, I attended a presentation on adaptive gaming. And by 2016, uh, there had been some developments in adaptive gaming, and there was more controllers that were available. One of those controllers was the quad stick. And with said controller, I was witnessing uh, other uh, people who had similar disabilities to my own playing games that I thought you needed two hands to play. Um, and I was so very, very wrong uh, that with this quad stick, you could play these games with simply with your mouth, um, which was wild to me. Uh, I quickly uh, figured out where to get one of these controllers and uh, ended up playing uh, the games, uh, starting to play the games again that I had been playing before my accident and uh, getting to experience those games again with my friends. And that was a great deal of fun. Um, and uh, that kind of brings me to where I am today with my gaming. Um, and can you go to the next slide, which is the end of my presentation? Thanks so much, Aaron. Appreciate it. Yep. So this is our hashtag, so everyone can game. We're working towards that, right, as an organization, and we really do believe in this. Um, with that, all comes open up for questions. Sorry, we ran over just a little bit. Hi there, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I have quite a few questions um, popped up in the chat and the q and I'm gonna let everybody know ahead of time, June 20th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time is the next um, webinar that we'll be having with Able Gamers when we're kind of digging more deep into the work. Um, and Andy, feel free to post your SurveyMonkey link in the chat if you wanna have people in the um, audience be able to take it. Um, from Paul Spots, um, you're asking if we can email you the PowerPoint. For sure, we are going to be getting an accessible, a fully accessible PowerPoint out to everybody on the registration list at the close of the meeting. We're going to be sending out an email to everybody who registered with a link to the recording also. Maurice asks, is there a wait list for peer counseling? There's a crazy wait list for peer counseling. Uh, because of that adaptive controller that we partnered up with Xbox and, and various advocacy awareness things that we do, there's inevitably people reaching out to us for help because we're a charity and we have the ability to do so. Um, several thousands of people are in our queue right now. We're slowly grinding them away, grinding away at that queue. Um, but essentially, these partnerships kind of exist because we need help doing this work, right? Uh, it frees up some of our time, frees up some of our resources to be able to figure this out for people. Uh, so it happens in a different number of ways, um, but there is a, there is quite a bit of, of a wait, yes. From Terrell, 
I'm currently an OT graduate student. I'm doing my capstone on adaptive video game controllers for people who do not have the fine motor control to manipulate standard controllers. This is all very interesting. Can this controller only be applied to the Xbox or can they be used on other consoles? I'm guessing this one came in when you were talking about the Xbox adaptive controller. Great question. This the XAC, the this controller, this is the one you're asking about. This can work on the PC and the Xbox natively. It works on the PlayStation 4 and 5 through a converter, and it also does work on the Nintendo Switch through a converter. All right. From Michael, does anybody know what percentage of people with disabilities do gaming? How is this broken down by people with physical disabilities versus developmental? I don't know if I have an answer to that. The people that we help on our end are people. So as you know, sometimes with like stroke, for example, produces impairments, issues, challenges, what have you in cognitive, sensory, motor, hearing, attention, all different sorts of things. Um, and so that's how we that's how we approach um, adaptive gaming. Not to say, oh, you only have paralysis in your hand, right? You also might have vision changes because of diabetes or you're just wearing glasses or you need bigger whatever. So that's how we help. I don't know if it's does, does that answer your question, maybe. Jesse has her hand up. Do you have an answer? Yes, once I unmute myself once again, that's been a trend all day. <laughs> Um, yes, I just wanted to add on to that. So um, from a research side, and especially when we were conducting our research, it's kind of hard to um, split it up into those groups because a lot of the community that we work with do have multiple disabilities. So a lot of it is physical, but then also there may be a cognitive aspect as well or an auditory or visual aspect as well. So we do help and serve that community. But in general, um, we do focus on the physical nature, but we will also always accommodate others as well. So um, to get back to the original point, um, I don't think concretely right now we have the data set to show like, oh, X amount with uh, cognitive disabilities and Y amount with physical disabilities because they intersect um, quite often. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and I'm sorry if we're moving at a brisk pace. We've only got a couple more minutes left and you guys had a lot of good questions. Are any games being developed slash created for blind um, vision impaired players our community is very limited in this area. This is coming from Kimberly. Yep, and I um, I second that it is limited within the blind community and it is a shame. Um, as of right now, um, uh, I don't know of any like development specifically to the blind community. I do have resources of blind games from websites as well that they're web-based games. And of course we do know of a few uh, titles that are pretty blind accessible, but it really would be a case by case basis a basis of what games would work best um, for the different, you know, the spectrum of blindness that there is within the community. Um, I know it's probably the answer you're not hoping for and I gosh do I wish I had a better answer, um, but unfortunately at this time. Um, all we can say is you know we keep pushing for blind accessibility within our training uh, with developers and hope continue the push forward. <laughs> Um, Andy, if, do you have anything to add or you'll, okay. No, that's very good. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for answering that. Louise tosses in the chat that Veil is an awesome game for limited vision. Um, Michael asks, how do organizations partner with you? We also have a queue developing on that. Um, it's our strategy to kind of develop out partnerships uh, with passionate organizations, passionate people with passionate organizations that want to do the work. We have to figure that out. It's basically a conversation that starts with me, takes a long time to kind of get through, right, Catherine, as we know. <laughs> uh, but it's really about figuring the resources, figuring out the impact, figuring out what what your community looks like and what, what the needs are, uh, and then taking it from there. So um, I'm on the website somewhere. Feel free to reach out and we can start that conversation. And we are at 10. Um, we're going to have to go because we have our interpretation book till 10. I'm going to ask one last question. Maybe we can get through it quick. Would someone that doesn't have a physical disability, but may have an intellectual and or developmental disability qualify for a program like this? This is fantastic work. Thank you. Um, awesome. My short answer is, of course. Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Go I was going to say that too. Yeah. Um, we do it by case by case basis. So yeah, um, we have helped in the past, um, you know, gamers with just, you know, intellectual disabilities. Um, uh, but yeah, again, it's very case by case basis. So but yeah, it's a great question. <laughs>
I still haven't run out the last one minute. Someone's asking what platforms the games were on, but there are a lot of games. I know that Slay the Spires on, on PlayStation because I play that one and Darkest Dungeons also on PlayStation because I play that one too. You have great taste in games, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have one more question. Let's see if we can get it. How did you make or find the 3D print template for the Switch controller? Scouring the internet. Yeah. I think, right for the most part um there's a there's github there's uh what is the other site jesse you know on top of your head there's another um, there's, you mean like i mean there's github but i mean there's thingiverse there's also principal is that what you mean yeah, yeah right. so Printables. thing of thing of verse there's an a in the middle of it and then printables.com yeah all great places and um terrell i'm putting my email into the chat um, you asked if there's any way to help in the Sacramento area, email me, we'll talk. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. We have to let our everyone go. Our interpretation is done for the day. Um, and we wanna make sure that everything we do is fully accessible. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you Able Gamers for all of the work that you do. Thank you so much for having us. So much. Cheers.